Good morning, brothers and sisters, and uh, let me add my welcome to that of Dan's to church this morning. Uh, I'm recording this uh, yesterday, Saturday morning, and thanks to Peter Merchant, who's come in to help me do this. It's just better I do this rather than spread my bugs all around. Uh, Our reading this morning is Matthew chapter 17, uh, beginning at verse 1, verses 1 to 13, page 871 of the Bibles in the pews, page 871. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James and his brother John and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. He was transfigured in front of them and his face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as light. Suddenly Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. I'll set up three shelters here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud covered them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down and were terrified. Jesus came up, touched them and said, Get up, don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus alone. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Don't tell anyone about the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. So the disciples asked him, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Elijah is coming and will restore everything, he replied. But I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they didn't recognize him. On the contrary, they did whatever they pleased to him. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we're returning uh, to Matthew's good news biography of Jesus. We're doing this over eight years. This is our fifth year. Uh, there's a, a little sermon postcard, a sermon series postcard in the newsletters that looks like this. And uh, the Bible studies are up the back as well as the household devotions. Uh, everything's pre-recorded, uh, recorded. well today's pre-recorded, isn't it, uh, recorded. And uh, if you miss out, uh, it will be available on our website uh, in the afternoon of Sunday. There's an outline in your newsletters. Uh, on the left-hand side, some household questions, top right. Uh, if I ask the question, who is Jesus, what answers do you think I'd get? Jesus is the man who loves. Jesus is the wisest teacher of all time. Uh, Jesus is a revolutionary turning the religious and social order on its head. Jesus is irrelevant, or even more commonly, who's Jesus? Now, you've heard all those statements before. I don't think any of them are shockingly original But they all lead to another question. What does this mean? If Jesus is the man who loves, then those who follow him must love as well, whatever you want to define love as. If Jesus is the wisest teacher, then he can become a desk calendar with a new quote for every day of the year and wise statements guide your life like he's a mentor. If Jesus is a revolutionary, he becomes a justification for everything from social revolution, <coughs> excuse me, to armed warfare through to religious anarchy. And if Jesus is irrelevant, then he becomes a joke for a television show like The Panel. Now, this might seem a little old to you, and perhaps we might be a little reactive, but I actually think it is relevant to God's mob both here and people out there. Uh, in the world out there, it's increasingly the case that Jesus is either irrelevant or non-existent, unknown. I was struck this week in SRE when I asked our classes who the New Testament is all about and the vast, vast majority of the answers had no connection to Jesus. Uh, In the world in here, amongst God's mob, Jesus is becoming more and more a contested figure, even to the point of his words being ignored, his deeds being undermined. At this midpoint of Matthew's good news biography of Jesus, those are the two questions in front of us. Who is Jesus and what does this mean? We're going to look at them this morning. Let me pray and then we'll get into it. Father, thanks for your word. I thank you that we can read it. Thanks for Matthew, a man who was taken from the outside and brought in, a sinner who was forgiven, a man who was restored to humanity. Thank you that he wrote this biography so we could meet Jesus and understand what it is to meet him as he truly is and how that will affect our lives. Please affect us today, in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Uh, there are four good news biographies of Jesus in the Bible. I, I give them that label uh, because they are accounts of Jesus' public ministry with a distinctive aim. Uh, they aim to tell the world the good news of who Jesus is, what he has done. Uh, each of the biographies have a particular focus, present the good news of Jesus uh, with a particular slant for particular reasons. In that way, they're no different to any other form of history. All history is written to stress certain perspectives. Matthew's good news biography is established in its opening verse, chapter 1, verse 1, an account of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. This is a biography, literally, of new beginnings. It's about a man called Jesus Christ. He's connected to two great figures from world history, well, particularly the history of God's people, King David, the ideal king of God's people, Abraham, through whom God said he would deal with the broken nature of the world. And when you look at that genealogy of this man, Jesus, the genealogy that follows that opening verse, you'll notice two things. It all revolves around the family trees of Abraham and David, and it has some women in it, to put it blightly, who are of slightly less than ideal public reputation. <coughs> Excuse me, and when you put all of that together with what follows, you could describe Matthew's good news biography in this way. God provides new beginnings through his promised King Jesus, who brings the outsiders in. The author himself, Matthew, is a living, breathing example of this, an outsider brought in. We hear about his meeting of Jesus in chapter 9 of this biography. Uh, As a Jew, he'd been a tax collector for the occupying Romans. As a collaborator, he was ostracized from polite Jewish society. As a Jew, he was on the outer of Roman society. And most significantly, as a sinner, he was on the outer with God. When Jesus invited Matthew to join him, Matthew had his sins forgiven. Matthew had the long-held promises of God confirmed. And through Jesus, Matthew was completely transformed. Not everyone had received Jesus like this. Not everyone had responded to the good news. The religious authorities of the time increasingly opposed Jesus. So by the time we reach the 12th chapter of this biography, they're seeking to destroy him. Those who knew Jesus best, his hometown, had rejected him in chapter 13. Even his own family struggled to know what to do with him in Matthew chapter 12. There's a massive crowd that follows Jesus everywhere. He heals them. He speaks to them. He's clear with them. He's transparent with all who meet him. He's come to deal with outsiders, humans on the outside. In the biggest sense, being an outsider means being outside God, being what the Bible calls a sinner, someone who has the attitude and action that says, I'm God and God's not, and that puts people offside with God. It makes them his enemies, that is, every human being. And so Matthew's put this good news biography together so that every human being can meet the bloke who's come to bring the outsiders in, and that includes people like us. Last year we finished at the moment of discernment in Matthew chapter 16. A discernment is making a decision based on the evidence God has put in front of you. In this case, a decision about Jesus. As readers, there's been a huge amount of evidence laid out. And as they are together in the far north of Israel, Jesus asks his disciples what people say about him. Peter states publicly in verse 16 of Matthew 16, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replies by saying very clearly what this means. He must go to Jerusalem suffer many things from the elders, chief priests and scribes, be killed and be raised on the third day, Matthew 16, 21. This completely turned on its head all that the disciples understood a Messiah to be. A Messiah was the promised saviour of the world, whom God said would restore God's creation and rule it rightly. Matthew has already asked who is Jesus and what does this mean, and we've seen those answers in chapter 16, and now he adds more. More to the picture of who Jesus is and what it means. I'm at point two on the outline. Jesus seems to have remained in the region of Caesarea Philippi, right up the north. Look at verses 1 to 3. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and his brother John and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. He was transfigured in front of them. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as the light. Suddenly Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with them. Jesus takes three disciples, 
Peter and the brothers James and John. He leads them up a high mountain. I hope you notice the tense I use there with those verbs. Those two verbs in verse 1 are in the present tense. It's as if Matthew wants to invite us as the readers to walk in to this episode, to join them as observers. All the other verbs are in the past tense. And so it's as if we've travelled with these men to the top of this mountain and now we are observing all that takes place and we're being encouraged to consider what happens. On that high mountain, Jesus is transformed. His face and his clothes, they shine, they glow, they're as bright as the sun. And that physical description of Jesus, as well as the location, would have been a trigger moment, a trigger moment of all sorts of memories and rememberings in the minds of the original readers. It sounds like an event that happened way back in history when a man called Moses met with God on another mountain, Mount Sinai, in Exodus 34, and Moses' face reflected the magnificence of God. In this case, Jesus isn't reflecting. Jesus is God himself. And I hope you notice there that the transformation is in front of them. The three witnesses couldn't avoid what was taking place. The revelation of Jesus, look at who he is, the revelation of Jesus is for their benefit. And two other figures appear as well. Two other grand figures from their history, Moses and Elijah. <coughs> Excuse me, they're chatting to Jesus, but do you notice they appeared to them? This is not a moment for Jesus. Not a moment where it suddenly twigs, ah, this is why I'm here. It's not a moment for Moses and Elijah. This is a moment for the disciples who are with Jesus and for us who've been invited in. So what's happening here? Well, we'll come to that question in a moment, but I suspect Peter's asking the same question, isn't he? Uh, he's struck by the occasion and all that he can offer is, uh, let me put up three tents so we can just make this moment stretch out like it's a wonderful sunset. Well, Peter's words fall like lead to the ground. As he's stumbling and stuttering, another voice speaks. Look at verse 5. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud covered them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Can you imagine such a scene? Peter is stuttering. A cloud descends on the mountaintop. The last time God's mob saw such an occasion was on that very same Mount Sinai that the magnificence of Jesus raised for them. That moment at Mount Sinai when the God who'd led them out of slavery made them his mob. The last time such a voice spoke was less than three years ago at the baptism of Jesus. And at that moment, as Jesus identified himself with humanity <coughs> and their sin, God spoke, this is my beloved son, I take delight in him. Back then, at his baptism, it was a public statement of who Jesus is, the son of God. It was a public statement of Jesus' authority, quoting Psalm 2, affirming that he is God's chosen king. It was a public statement of Jesus' role. He represented God fully and humanity sufficiently. And here it is again. But there's more this time, isn't there? Did you notice that? Did you catch the addition? At this moment of discernment, remember Peter and what Jesus had revealed the previous chapter, at this moment of discernment, God wants these three disciples and us to know what this means. Listen <coughs> to him. Did you hear that? It's a command. It's a command that emerges from who Jesus is. It's a command that states publicly in front of three witnesses that there is no more than Jesus. Jesus is it. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down and were terrified. What is happening here? Well, I think we have the other side of the coin with the same kind of parts as what has just happened a little earlier in chapter 16. Uh, then who is Jesus was answered. He's the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Uh, what does that mean? He must be rejected, die and rise again. It means that he will build his mob and it means that to follow him is to take up your cross. 
Who is Jesus? What does this mean? The same is going on here. We see the magnificence of the Saviour King. Who is Jesus? He's God himself. You can have no other conclusion. And there's certainly no debate, especially for a Jew for whom three witnesses was enough. This man, Jesus, is God's son, the promised king of the world, who will restore the whole universe and restore humanity. The physical evidence points to that truth, as Jesus is transformed in a way that only God himself can be. This man is God's promised saviour of the world, Moses and Elijah, are representatives of the whole Old Testament, the law, Moses, the prophets, Elijah. Moses and Elijah oversaw two great salvation events. Moses led God's people in the Exodus out of slavery in Egypt. Elijah confronted the priests of false gods under the rule of Ahab and Jezebel, saving God's people from false teaching. Moses and Elijah are both precursors, we are told, to the moment when God himself will come to deal with human sin on the day of the Lord. That's what Malachi, remember that other reading we had? That's what Malachi, the very last prophet in the Old Testament, is all about there at the end. Malachi said very clearly, remember Moses and look for Elijah. (coughs) When they come, that will be the moment that you know God has come to deal with the brokenness of sin and to restore his people. This man, Jesus, is everything God promised and planned. And the very words of God make it clear too, don't they? This is the one God promised would come to rule the world despite our aspirations. Who is Jesus? He's God's promised saviour king of the universe. God himself come to deal with human sin, come to restore human beings to save them from the consequences of their own aspirations to be God. Come to set the world right. What does that mean? Listen to him. A clear command, a natural result faced with who Jesus is. All of this has been for the benefit of the three disciples and us as observers. At, At this moment of discernment, we see the grandness and goodness and glory of Jesus exactly as God promised. Now, the way of our world with such a king, I'm at point three on the outline, the way of our world with such a king, with such authority, uh, with such a command behind him, (coughs) well, the way our world deals with people like this is it puts them on thrones with unlimited power. Our history is limited with dictators who aspire to be like this. Jesus could well be the same. Look there in verse 7. Jesus came up, touched them, said, get up, don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, don't tell anyone about the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. Isn't it good that Jesus is nothing like the rulers of our world? Jesus has no image of himself on massive ten-story buildings. Jesus doesn't have rallies and marches and mass programs of indoctrination. Jesus is God who reaches out to touch those who are stricken by terror when they meet him. Jesus is God, who reassures those who fall in terror when they meet him as he truly is. Jesus is God, who not only touches his mob, but speaks to them with words that they can hear. And as they descend the mountain, Jesus is very discerning, isn't he? Because he knows the heart of humans. He knows what humans would do with this moment, how they would misuse it and mistake it and misapply it. This is a moment to remember. This is a moment to proclaim once Jesus actually has achieved his work of being rejected, killed and raised from the dead to deal with sin. In a world that misuses power and glory and magnificence, Jesus is unlike any other worldly ruler. Now, the disciples are struggling to get their mind around this. I'm at point four on the outline. And let me be blunt. I understand their confusion. On the descent, they asked Jesus a question. Look at verse 10. So the disciples asked him, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? (coughs) Excuse me. Elijah is coming and will restore everything, he replied. But I tell you, Elijah has already come and they didn't recognize him. On the contrary, they did whatever they pleased to him. 
in the same way the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. I, I suspect, given what they'd heard in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, the disciples understood where Jesus and Moses fit. After all, Jesus had said there in Matthew 5 that he was everything that the Old Testament law was talking about, God in the flesh. But Elijah, and he's just appeared with Moses on that mountain. So they asked the question that comes straight from that last book of the Old Testament, Malachi. Why do all the religious purists say that Elijah must come first before God sets the world aright? But Jesus agrees with them. That's exactly what God said. That's exactly what Malachi spoke about. Moreover, God has done exactly what he promised. He sent John the Baptist. John the Baptist smelt like a prophet. He talked like a prophet. He ate like a prophet. He lived like a prophet. He rebuked like a prophet. That's the Elijah that God promised, and he's already come. Did they listen to him? No. Did they recognize him? No. Did they kill him? Yes. They did whatever they pleased with him. And Jesus makes sure his disciples understand the consequence. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. On the one hand, this is a return to everything they did not understand. A Messiah who dies and is rejected. A Messiah who uses all of that immense power as God to be sacrificed. A Messiah rejected by his own people. On the other hand, these disciples are starting to listen. They're beginning to grasp the plan of God. Look there at verse 13. Then the disciples understood that he had spoke what he that he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. The disciples hear Jesus' words. And they do what God commanded them to. They listen to Jesus' words. They're growing in their understanding. It's a slow growth. It's a tentative growth. But it's a growth that shows them listening in obedience to Jesus as God commanded. So who is Jesus and what does that mean? I'm at point five on the outline. We have to see Jesus here as he is. He is God himself with all of God's glory, all of God's magnificence, all of God's power, all of God's magnitude. In the true sense of the word, he is awesome and terrifying to behold. We cannot miss this Jesus. We've been observers the whole time, and there are three witnesses. This is God himself. I really don't know how to make that any clearer, or any more awe-inspiring. Just capture who Jesus is. Within the church as his disciples, we must listen to this Jesus. Here is a very clear message to our gathering as God's people. Listen to him. And we have an example of what that truly looks like as the disciples descend. We need to be reminded of this. Remember from our series of who we are, that this is a man with all authority and power in heaven and on earth. We must listen to him. All of him. We have to see Jesus here as he came. He came in the flesh, this exact image of God, in order to reach out to the terrified, the broken, and the outsider. Jesus came to bring a greater salvation than Moses and Elijah. Jesus came to deal with the judgment of sin. Jesus came exactly as God promised, and that's not distant or abstract. It's the truth that Jesus demonstrates every time he reaches out and touches someone, like a leper in Matthew 8 verse 3, like a woman with a fever in Matthew 8 verse 15, like people who are blind in Matthew 9, 29 and 20, 34. In, in each, Jesus reaches to people who are terrified and broken, touches them, restores them and speaks to them. And he'll be treated exactly like they treated John the Baptist. He will be rejected. He will suffer and die and rise again. We, we've got to listen to this Jesus as people of the world. There's nothing more than him. There's no more after him. There is no extra beside him. Jesus is the final revelation of God. And there is no other hope for this broken world. Let me pray. 
Father, thank you uh, for bringing us in as observers, uh, for taking us up to that mountaintop and watching and seeing Jesus revealed as he truly is and as he came. Thank you that he is all of your magnificence and wonder and glory, and thank you that he reaches out and touches and reassures the terrified and the broken, and he restores them. Father, within your people, remind us to listen to him. Even as he says things we struggle with, we might uh, not understand, we even might disagree with, please help us to listen to him and to obey him as he is. A father in the world as it is, help us to point out that there's no more than Jesus. There's no other solution, no other salvation. He is it, and he will reach out and touch and bring the outsider in as we turn to him. Please help many to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Question from verse 9, where it says, don't tell anyone about the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. Yeah. Why do you think he asks them not to talk about it for a while? Yeah, so um, Peter's asked a good question. Verse 9, why does Jesus um, ask them not to reveal this vision until he's been raised from the dead? I think that's the moment where Jesus shows his discernment about the human heart. Uh, he knows what humans could do with such a display of power and how they might misapply or uh, misunderstand such power. I suspect that's behind, and uh, you can bail me up later on, I suspect that's behind Judas Iscariot. Um, Judas Iscariot's last name, Iscariot, uh, is actually a word used for, ro- for revolutionaries who wanted an armed revolution to get rid of the Romans. I suspect if these three came down from the mountain and started talking about what they'd seen, there would have been an armed revolution that would have taken Jesus away from his job and caused untold suffering. So there's a moment for revelation to be spoken, and it's after he's been revealed as the one who's dealt with the key issue, which is death and sin, not the Romans. So I suspect this is actually the last moment where he tells them to do that. Uh, at no other point from what I can remember in Matthew does he say, hold your tongues, because there's no other greater revelation, is there? But I think he he's displaying his discernment about the human heart and how they might misapply uh, what they've seen. Does that answer your question? For, for, for all those watching on Sunday, Peter said yes. 